Well, we're so. all very interested in student achievement, and I think the administration is just uh, equally concerned about it also. So uh, we all need to work together to improve student achievement. Trustee Lane? Uh, Dr. Patterson, do you think the state of Michigan is, I mean, we could test for a lot of things, but is the state measuring what we should be measuring in math and in English and other things? I mean, uh, if we're not aligned with the state, with what the state's testing, obviously we'll look like we're failing and we could have kids doing brilliantly. So uh, to me, the question is, are we testing and are we testing for results that are meaningful um, we have a lot of students leaving our college without graduating. They're going to four-year universities. So what do we say? They're failures? No. The, the test has to be predictive of something. And then are we defeating ourselves as a state when we constantly change our measurements? Do we, I think what one thing we need is to choose a test and stay with the damn test. We can't constantly change it. No, I, I agree. And in terms of is what we're testing mean, meaningful, the, the, the M step I know has come under, under a lot of controversy over the last few years. It's actually drawn upon the item bank that was created for Smarter Balanced. And that test, as intended, came with it a lot of resources to be used in the classroom to help inform some of the instructional decisions that are made. There were formative assessments and resources available. When the state adopted that resource, it didn't really provide any of those things to school. Mm -hmm. So I, I, it is a little frustrating that many of our schools want to have a better idea what some of those expectations are, mm -hmm. but some of those blueprints and resources have not been readily available. So to paraphrase you, the state told us which test to use and then didn't give us the money to purchase the materials for it. Yeah, so, so in other words, is it self-defeating? Th there's, there's not a lot of resources available for mm -hmm. schools to easily get to to kind of help them look at that. I mean, we can take a look at the Smarter mm -hmm. Balanced Assessment mm -hmm. and pull some things from there, but the state also has not provided some of the technical reports and other things that go along with testing for the last few years. And they did make a few changes um, to how the test is delivered as well. So although... The items, I think, do reach the rigor that we do want our students to attain to. There's a lot left to be desired in terms of building that aligned system between the resources we have and what we're expecting kids to do on the assessments. But we're still working towards making sure those pieces fit together. Trustee Hamu. Quite frankly, I think we are all sick and tired of the state changing the tests over and over again. And I think these numbers are also reflective of what the state has been doing. Um, it's my understanding that within the past 10 years, the test has changed at least four times. And that affects performance, and it affects performance tremendously. Mm -hmm. Now, I do have to give it to the district, too, because even though these tests keep on changing, and here we are catching up because we know that changing the test affects performance, we're doing things in terms with early childhood development, right? That's where we're investing, and that's where we need to keep on investing. I know we read that how many teachers did we add this year in terms of our ELD teachers in these classes? Um, so with not enough resources from the state. So even though you know we're seeing these numbers, we're doing everything we can, but it, it truly is exhausting because it does feel like a game of catch up. So how do these tests affect performances or the change of these tests affect performance? Have you seen it in, in the numbers? Yeah, and that has made it hard to look at year to year comparisons because you are correct. We went from the MEEP to piloting Smarter Balance for a year, then going to M-STEP, which was predominantly paper and pencil to have it going online. Last year, they took away the performance task and added a text-dependent analysis question. Um, this year, they're looking to pilot passage-based writing, and it does make it hard to see if the changes in the test scores are actually reflective of our changes in instructional practices, which is what you hope would happen in a good system where you're getting feedback that you need. So that, that has made it challenging. Trustee Barry? Dr. Patterson, with, with the changes of the the testing and everything else the state does, 
I'm pretty sure it makes your job more difficult to compare one year to another. It makes our educators' job more difficult to educate our young ones. Well, you personally, how confident are you of these results that you're providing to us tonight? I mean, are these accurate numbers? I, I would feel more comfortable if we saw some technical reports from the state. In, uh, in, in most testing systems, after the test has been administered, they provide some details in terms of the test statistics and the, and the blueprint. We haven't seen that in a number of years. So while I, like I had said, while I feel like the individual items in the test are of a, of a good quality and do assess higher order thinking skills, it does make it challenging for schools to really use this to, to drive some of their instruction, which is why um, on the last slide in terms of our focus, it's really not looking so much at, at the test scores, although we do want to take those things into consideration and, and let them be reflective of what we're doing, but we really want to focus on the essential understandings we want kids to know can they transfer those to several different situations and really show their competence in the area through multiple measures? When I listen to your report and I make my comments or my questions, it has nothing to do, I'm, I'm not questioning the district, I'm not questioning Dr. Maleko, his leadership. Uh, I mean, I know we're a team here. I mean, look at, look at all the rewards and everything we went through today. Uh, I just believe that you know, if, if there's an issue here, we need to take ownership and deal with it. And I know, there's no doubt in my mind, these are some very difficult challenges for our district. To sit there and look at these numbers, nobody's happy with these numbers. But I, like I said, we need to take ownership and this is, mm -hmm. this is in everybody's lap here, everybody at this table and every employee of this district. So thank you. Can I just mention one thing too, and I was talking to, to you know, the, something that started under Superintendent Wiston and we've tripled and Shannon provided the report and I can't remember the exact number, but we have over 80% of our students that enter, is it a college, whether that be a two or four year, Shannon, I don't know if you can comment on that. And so even though they may not be going, and that's what kind of works, just to clarify my point on the SAT, is that some of those students, they're also benefiting from us because of our massive dual enrollment that I know uh, the college president has commented on, is that our students, with the cost of college nowadays and what started, is that a lot of our students are, what they're doing is they're going into the two-year and then they're jumping into a four-year um, university right. in many so, cases. Uh, now, now I'm going by memory. I think it was 86% of our students in the 2015-16 um, class that enrolled in post-secondary, where the state average is like 67%. I might get a percent off, but that's the gist of it. 80% of our students who would go to a four-year university test into college coursework automatically. Our students that go to Henry Ford, that's the community college numbers that we have, and 73% of them end up in developmental math. Interestingly enough, the college is now adjusting the test that they give, the Accuplacer. So imagine starting a test that, that is adaptive that starts you at math, basic math, that you haven't done in a very long time. And if you don't get those right, you don't get to the stuff you've been doing in high school. So they're actually, the test is gonna be flipping, so it starts with the most current, and then it bumps you down instead of making you climb up and remember ratios and proportions that you did in seventh grade. That I, I'm just gonna tell you, I had to help my own son with some of this, and I had to go on to Khan Academy myself because it's, I, I haven't done it in a long, long time. So, but when you look at how our students do at Henry Ford, 93% of them, you know, pass their classes with a C or higher, and that, that includes our ELs compared to our, all of our students. So do we have, in, you know, do we have an issue with M-STEP? I would say yes, but I've yet to be able to see the M-STEP items to know is it, is it they can't meet the standard at all, or is it the way the question is worded? Like we don't know, at least with the PSAT and SAT, we can look at released items. We can actually look at the vocabulary that's used in the tests and how the questions are written. Um, the state took that right away from us a long time ago, because when I was a teacher, we used to use that information to help us understand, is it, is it really they don't know the information, or are they misreading the question? So there's lots of, lots of things that go into that that we look at, but when our students leave us and go to Henry Ford or Wayne State or U of M or wherever, um, 
they manage and they manage well. Trustee Lane. The success of their lives is actually the greatest proof that we are teaching them successfully. Uh, but I think we ought to ask the, the state legislature to take some of these exams, like the M-STEP or the college placement <coughs> exam, and see, are they successful? Are they failing? And I would bet you right now that half the state legislature would fail those tests, and yet we don't count them <laughs> unsuccessful. Quick question. I, I definitely agree, if I may. Yes, Do, does the state or the NWEA take into consideration at-risk students when making these state uh, these average comparisons? That's an average. <coughs> All we get is an average, correct? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is your area, but an average is an average. So we have high and low, and it doesn't it doesn't take into effect the different need. So needs are not considered. Immigrant populations are not right. considered. Uh, which is why you are not considered us to look at our data for Henry Ford, and that we'll be presenting that next month. Yeah, I gave you a little snapshot in board briefs, but yes, thank you. You know, um, and that is so important. And the fact that that's not taken into consideration really does us a disservice and puts us in a light that we don't. So need the to question ban. is: Yes, we know we have to improve, and I will tell you that we've also been without updated resources for a while right because times were tough so when times are tough we don't get new resources and I would happily walk with any of you in the classrooms in elementary right now with new math I'm watching kindergarten first kindergarten first graders and those teachers like they they're starting something new but the kids are so new to school that there's not a big change if you talk to a second third or fourth or fifth grade teacher there they're struggling a bit because the rigor has changed so I had a teacher, she was very, she was a math leader, second grade teacher, was very upset, saying that she didn't like the new program. Some of the kids can do the work, some of them, but not all of them. And so she wanted to show me a test and she showed me a pre and post test. And she had ni nicely put together like how many students got 90 to 100% and how many got you know, 80 to 89. And when I looked at her results with her, I said, so 70% of your students with a more rigorous curriculum and tests, got a C or better right after the first test. Wow, 70%. Hmm. So you have to work with the, the eight that are struggling. But 70% of them got that, and we've raised the rigor on them. So we're gonna get there. You should see the look on your face saying that. <laughs> You understand me. When we get to 50%, I'm going to challenge you to go to 60. Once we get to 60, I'm going to keep challenging you. That's, I am a figure that's, skater. That's, I will that's, beat that's you all the way. point I'm trying to make. <laughs> you, honest to God, you should see how your face lit up when you're saying she got the 70%. Mm -hmm. Hey, why can't we go in that direction? That's all I want. We're going. Thank you. <laughs> and, and that third grade reading law is an attack on our at-risk students. Just like these tests are an attack on our, on our at-risk students our ELL population, our poverty population, that's who these standards and these tests are attack on, on people that live in our communities. And it's turning a, a blind eye on populations like ours. When you say population like ours? Third grade, the third grade reading law that they are imposing, this directly affects at-risk communities like ours, where we have immigrant parents immigrant populations not even getting enough resources to obviously our population doesn't look the same as other populations across the state you know I was gonna wait till later in this uh, agenda to go through this but uh, I served on this committee in Detroit part of citizen Detroit and we interviewed the candidates for the Detroit School Board one of the questions was, starting in 2019, 2020 school year, this is referred to the Michigan's third grade uh, reading law. Uh, state law will require all students in Michigan to hold back third graders who are not reading at the grade level. What role do you think the school board can play in preparing families for the implementation of this policy? Uh, and Dr. Mead, I'm not gonna mention names, but I did get permission from the moms to uh, go over these numbers right here. Uh, two, different, two different families. One family is living in Dearborn, working mom, drops off her kids at school, 
goes to work, comes back, she trusts us, moves away from the state of Michigan. And I don't, I don't remember what district she ended up down south. And they were ready to demote her girls because she wasn't re the, the girls weren't reading at the level. They were reading two grades below. She says, no way. She fought back and asked for time, and they gave her time. And on her own, and this is a single mom, on her own, she got her girls up, not two grades, but at least one grade, and the district was said, okay, we're good. Then we have a different, different set of girls. ELL population, I mean, just because it's ELL doesn't mean that they can't succeed. I asked five different teachers, three in our district, two outside of the district, so it doesn't sound biased. If I give you a student in the kindergarten, doesn't speak one word of English, three to four years later, can you get them to read less than maybe a grade level behind? Five out of five said yes. This is an ELL student. This is the WIDA, this is the, this is the WIDA results here. As a first grader, this student, I guess the right word here is profession, profession, professionally level, proficiency level, as a first grade, was reading at a 5.1. If, if I understand this right, this is a 5.1 out of six with the WIDA? Yeah. Thank you. At the second grade, second grade, she was still at the five proficiently, proficiency level. Let's, let's switch over to the M step. So this is, this is you're referring to one student? This is, this is yeah, but, but this is two examples. It might be the outliers, it might be two different, uh, you know, two opposite ends, but we can't keep saying that ELL students, some of the reasons is because ELL students, ELL students. I'm not gonna waste too much time, but this is a student by the fifth grade, she's reading at a, above, probably at the high school level. What's the difference is parents have to be involved. Our, our educators, our teachers especially, are taking a beating. They are taking a beating. We need to figure out a way. We need to figure out a way to get our parents. If we have to, I mean, I know we're doing home visits. We have to figure out a way to get to the parents and tell them. It's okay, it's a state law, and I agree with what Trustee Lane uh, always says about the state. I fully agree with you, but this is something we're gonna have to deal with. Honest to God, some of these candidates in Detroit, and I don't wanna take punches at people that can't defend themselves now. They had no clue what I was talking about, first of all. Thankful, you know, this administ our administration's been educating us on this law, and this is something we're gonna have to deal with next year. We can't just push it aside. So instead of just keep going through these numbers, this is a very successful student that mom or dad or uncle gave her the love of reading early in her life. She's gonna, be, she, she's gonna be an engineer someplace, a doctor or something. But just because of our ELL population and the percentage of our ELL population, we can't keep saying, we can't keep using that as a crutch. And, and we can't say that they don't need the resources necessary for us to educate those parents as resources. well. 100% we need the resources. Yes. That's not what I'm saying. Somehow, someway, I mean, my point, the only reason I have these numbers is because I was going to say to Dr. Maleko, maybe from now on in your report, give us some updates. What are we doing to get the parents on board? Can't blame the teachers. Teachers, God bless what they're doing. Well, somehow, some way, do, the, do our parents know currently, I mean, you don't have to answer that, I'm just asking a general question here. Our parents know what's going to happen next year? Our, our parents of our second graders? I asked the last meeting, you know, how many, how many of our third graders next year start out with kindergartens? It was something like 85%. 85% of our, third, our students going to the third grade next year came to us as kindergartners. They didn't just show up here last year or the year before. They, they've been here for a few years with us. So um, our shared goal between parents, principals, teachers, support staff is to get all of our students to grade level. Thank you. And it's gonna take certainly a team, a village, all of us to help all of our students get there because a significant number of our students, as we know, start school well below the average or well below grade level. And working with parents and teachers, 
we are able to reduce that number so that the number is much lower by the time they get to third grade. And there are lots with about 1,500 students in each grade level, there are lots of different examples of how they're able to be successful. So um, the district has implemented a number of initiatives based on not only what is right for students, but also what it says in Public Law 306. And one of the points in Public Law 306, the read by third grade law, says that we, all districts, not just Dearborn, have to provide an individual reading improvement plan for every student who is more than a year behind. Sure. And so this month, uh, Dr. Patterson's department worked with the principals um, to use our data system to generate reports for all of the first and second grade students who are more than a year behind. And those reports are currently being shared with parents in writing with the understanding that they need to catch up with parents at parent conferences right now. Um, uh, uh, Superintendent Wisdom also implemented something in our district uh, called the Parent Contract, which started in third grade, fifth grade, and then middle school, which uh, did something similar. The goal is certainly um, there is no desire to retain children. The goal is to inform parents so that we can work as partners to get kids to be successful, to love reading, to feel successful in school, and certainly to achieve not only on assessments but in anything else they, they choose to, um, to engage in. So there are lots of initiatives that the board has supported that principals and teachers are currently engaged in now to ensure that kids are catching up and everyone is working as effectively as possible in order to, to get the kids there. Dr. Choco, thank you. That's music to my ears, but you, you said something in writing. Are we getting a signature from the parents, and I don't care if it's English, Arabic, Spanish, whatever, are we getting a signature from the parents that they understand? We are. That's in writing? We That's are. That's beautiful. Thank you. So, so maybe a year or two years down the road when things have to happen, that parent can't play, I didn't know. Right. So and again, that's where the parent very, contracts started several years ago. The idea, again, that, yeah. is not to penalize the family, but it's to also support the family to say, yes, we discussed this in kindergarten. Yes, we discussed this in first grade. Yes, your child has been receiving additional assistance, but we need your support at home by reading every night, working on whatever kinds of activities and assignments would benefit the student, as well as helping to limit that summer learning loss. NWEA, this is our fifth year, that was the first assessment in a very long time that our district has had that showed us where students started and where they were able to get by the end of a school year. And the majority of our students outstrip the national growth. They are growing faster, they are achieving greater growth than the national average because they have to catch up. And so what's happening during the summer, however, is they're losing a lot of that. And so when they come back in September, in many cases and places, they are starting at lower levels than when they left in June. So it takes them a couple of months to, again, reacquire those skills and abilities, start applying, and then the achievement and the growth starts for that new school year. Just to back up what you just said, the student I was referring to, I noticed between June and September, after the fourth grade, the, the, their, their efficiency level dropped. Mm -hmm following year it gained I'm like what's the I asked what's the difference the year before they went on like four vacations following summer stay at home spending more time in the library so maybe if we get our conditioning in our schools that's a different discussion <laughs> Oops, <laughs> that is a that different way. discussion but again parents as partners with with the schools um, you know again together we will our goal is to get every child it takes a village and I know there's a lot of uh, a lot of uh, organizations in our community are willing to help out. A lot of nonprofits are willing to help Access out. I know there's a right student there initiative. Mm -hmm. There's a student initi initiative about you know bringing books to to homes. Uh, I think it's young people from our from our public schools that they are doing that. So yeah, it does take a village. So yeah. thank you. Yeah, that was good news. Thank you, Dr. Choco, for coming up to help immensely. Thank you, sir. Next thank you. Next item, please. Next item, where are we at? Is it okay on time? Items. We're still okay on time. I think we can finish up here. Yeah. Action items, special consideration of an action item. 
Are there any agenda items on this agenda which board members or the superintendent wish to discuss and vote on separately? If there are, we will exclude these from the motion below. There is an item that we have to do a roll call. Which one's that? Help me. Which one do we make? We have a roll call on that. I didn't see. I didn't see. I didn't see one. Bond. Mm. It doesn't have to be a roll call. It doesn't have to be. That's just a direction. It does not. It does not. Oh, okay. I thought it did. Okay. Unless Good. you want it. No. 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 We, we don't can sit and discuss it. it for 20 minutes if you'd like. No. No. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> recommended action: move that action items numbered one through 19 be approved as recommended in this agenda. So move. Support. It I'm sorry. Been, I'm sorry. It was just pointed out to me that it's 20. I always forget about the approval of the so so One three. through 20 be approved. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was a. Okay, it's been moved and supported. Any further discussion? Yes, sir. Two quick comments. On number seven, approval of change orders. I know we have these, that we've had these on our agenda. Just for my colleagues, I want to say that uh, Trustee Lane and Trustee Petrikoff and I, when we met in building a site, we asked Tom Walls and his team but uh, are the, are the change orders are within the range that you're comfortable with, and the answer was yes. So I feel confident that we're in good shape. And the other one, the other comment is number 16, the potential bond proposal. I guess at the study session, I made some comments. I was kind of shocked that people are actually listening, but uh, uh, with my comments about we should think twice about going out in 2019 does not mean that I don't support what we're doing. I fully support the direction we're going. And I did mention that in an off year, there's a group that will make a bigger difference in the, you know, in the outcome of the, of the bond. And people were asking me who you're referring to. I thought it was obvious, but I guess it wasn't. I was referring to the absentee voters. Absentee voters vote every elections. And that's what I was referring to, so. Okay, thank that's you. Any guess. further discussion? All those in favor of the motion, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? It's unanimous. Next item, please. Summary of agenda action items. Bear with me, there's 20 of them, Dr. Mead. Okay. Number one is approval of warrants. Number two, approval of blanket order to Dearborn Speech and Sensory Center Incorporated. Number three, approval of contact to Steinway Piano Gallery. Number four, approval of contract to Benchmark Education Company. Number five, approval of contract to environmental testing and consulting. Number six through eight, approval of change orders. Number nine, approval of contract to city contracting services. Number 10, approval of contract to Allark Development Group. Number 11, approval of contract to Burvis and Foster Incorporated. Number 12 through 15, approval of non-instructional and instructional personnel items for P through 12. Number 16, approval of financial statement. Number 17, approval for the administration to move forward preparing for a potential bond for November 2019. Number 18, approval of policy updates slash changes per port report 18-59. Number 19, approval of the resolution for the proposed refunding of the 2009 refunding bonds, general obligation, unlimited tax to Henry Ford College. And number 20, approval of donations. Next, next item. Next item. Discussion item. So we'll have Ms. Ali Bazzi. She has Policy a very updates. brief, oh sorry, a very brief presentation. Good evening, trustees. Um, the policy committee met today and we um, decided to table two of the three um, items that we were going to have as a discussion item today. Physical examination. We wanted to get more information from our attorney on that policy. Also, the unrequested leave of absence and and that policy, we wanted to get more information based on the NEOLA update. We had more questions, so we decided to table those two items so they will not be on for voting next month. Uh, however, the weapons policy we reviewed once again, uh, given all the changes in the laws, and there are no changes to the policy, so the current policy will stay stand as is. Any questions? Well, that's pretty brief. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Next item is uh, Board of Education Business. First item is Acknowledgement of Correspondence. Next item is Board Member Committee and Organization Reports. All right, I have a couple of committee reports. 
one I'm, I'm going to do um, really quickly. It's the Finance Committee, and I'm doing it on behalf of uh, Trustee Barry. And Trustee um, Barry is thankful to you for that. <laughs> we, we, we did hear a more in-depth um, report on the audit of the um, condensed version that you saw tonight. So the only thing that I think that we really need to remind everybody is that we had an unmodified report, which means there wasn't any problems really found with our audit. And we have a healthy enough fund balance to um, feel comfortable that if anything unforeseen were to happen um, in the district, we would be prepared to um, handle it financially going forward while still providing for our school community. Okay, the other was a building and site committee uh, meeting, and we had a lot of different topics on there, some of which were touched on tonight. One is that we are going to move forward now that we have passed the um, direction on how we want to um, look at a bond proposal for 2019. So we will be looking at a committee being formed that will um, have a conversation about how to flesh out the bond proposal. This committee will um, put it, a um, architect and a contractor and an owner's agent in place that will um, develop the parameters of the ballot proposal. And we hope to have everything ready to be presented to the board by early spring. Um, that we can either vote up or down as to whether we want to proceed for a November um, bond proposal. The, we have kitchen renovations going on at Maples and Lori. Um, they're going out for bid, and the construction will occur during the summertime of 2019. Um, air conditioning, uh, we are moving forward. We have all the equipment um, being stored uh, to provide a air conditioning space at all of our um, buildings. And they will be looking at um, finding installation uh, contractors. And we're hoping that by spring, every building will have a large enough room that will provide uh, relief during the hot weather. Salina Intermediate, of course, it has, uh, was approved at last month's meeting with a donation of 200000 and they are moving forward with plans for that air conditioning unit for the third floor, um, which includes also having to renovate um, the electrical uh, component of the school to support uh, more air conditioning in the building, so they are going to um, put an LED lighting that will take some... Um, uh, relief off of the electrical um, structure so that it can provide the air conditioning unit. We talked about hydration stations and um, every uh, school in the elementary level will be looking at at least one station. If their PTAs or and or other fundraising programs are going to be interested in still s supplying more of these hydration stations, they are more of welcome to uh, continue to donate to that as well. Um, the Dearborn High School room additions and cafeteria. The cafeteria is basically just about done. We're going to be ready for a ribbon cutting on that um, and the students are going to be able to start using it. Um, the four classrooms are almost ready as well and next uh, January we hope to see the students being able to enjoy the uh, additional space there. Uh, the Fortson machine shop uh, rooms are going to be renovated to make two classrooms. Miller is going to have an office suite uh, renovated as well to provide an extra classroom there due to um, additional students on site. And I think that's about it. Anybody, did I miss anything? That's good news. That's a, yeah. Okay, good so news. we have a, a lot, lot of, of projects yeah, in the yeah, works. Yeah, no, that's really good news. A lot, which uh, I'll make the, the policy one really easy. Okay. <laughs> the policy committee met today, and Mason said everything that needed to be said. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, there Mason. There we go. <laughs> Next, item. Next item is board member, superintendent, commentary. 
Oh, I think we should be all, oh, of course you're not coming to doubt. <laughs> very, very quick. Very quick. Uh, I too, I know it's been mentioned a couple of times, I am too uh, thankful for our veterans and wish them a happy Veterans Day. And 10 days from now is one of my favorite days of the year, Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. So happy Thanksgiving to everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that quick enough, Mary? Yeah. <laughs> Trustee Lane? Uh, I would like to request Thinking Ahead to be put on the City Relations Committee. Mm -hmm. uh, incoming president. Uh, I've never served on that committee, so just thinking about next oh, year. Oh, you're really moving ahead. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking far ahead, so. It's not too far ahead. Yeah, not too. Uh, yeah, the not time too. flies. <coughs> Anybody? Yes, Trustee Hamoud. I know that we had many celebrations today, so wanted to save some of my comments to till the end. But I was, I was honestly in tears today uh, watching you, Dr. Maleko, receive that award and, you know, having your family here. Uh, I'm, you know, Glenn is constantly thanking others, right, and saying this is all of our award. And I told him this morning, this was you. I mean, this was you, of course, and the people before you. And, and you constantly give credit where credit is due. And a true leader leads alongside his teammates. And that's, that's I think, um, what you've been and what you've done. And your desire to grow and challenge yourself, accept criticism and, you know, end every conversation with, what else do you think I could do? Um, can I do better? Uh, you know, I, I've learned from you in that regard. You have brought pride to every single one of us and to our district by this award. And, uh, I am so proud to serve on this board and to have you lead this district. Uh, so a very, 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 very well-deserved award. This was an honor to every single one of us. In fact, at work today at Wayne County, I couldn't wait to see everybody and tell them exactly what our superintendent is doing here in uh, public school, in Dearborn Public Schools. That was uh, an honor and I will treasure that. And that today was probably one of the highlights um, of me serving on the board. <coughs> And uh, I congratulate your family. Uh, I want to thank them. I know the sacrifice of your family, your wife. You know, uh, Glenn is everywhere. And if you don't believe it, look at his social media. Um, constantly, sometimes he's criticized. He was only here for five minutes. But it's because he wants to make everybody feel that they're important. So often he's hopping around. And, and I respect you for that because you give you want to be there for everyone, and sometimes you forget yourself in the process. So I hope you take some time to celebrate that. And you know, having STEM Middle School to be the only middle school in the state to receive a Blue Ribbon Award this year is truly a testament, again, to your leadership, your past leadership, every single one of the team here. And you know, again, I am just bursting with joy. I'm so proud to serve with every single one of you. Uh, with you, Glenn, with your team, with the staff, the students. And uh, with that, I also um, want to congratulate everybody that ran um, and, of course, the people that will be serving. I know that um, Roxanne is in the audience today. I look forward to serving with you as well. I know that Jim, uh, who, who's not here today, but this, this is just, this is a great team. And a part of this team is, of course, Celia Nasser. And so I'll end with this, and I know this was a long speech, but I know we said this before, and um, it has truly been pleasure working with you as well. And I am very sad that today is your last board meeting. I've said this before. Next week, yeah, you know, it's not. Say. Next, your last <laughs> P12 meeting, P12 meeting. You know, um, it wasn't easy sitting in your seat. And like I said before, you sat there with dignity, with class, and the moment you sat down there, you decided to serve and nothing else. And I respect that. And it's also been pleasure working with you. And thank you for being a teammate and for also guiding and assisting Glenn in the district. And uh, so with that said, I'm a very happy person today. And it truly has been one of you know, the highlights of my service uh, on this board. Here, Congrats, here. Glenn. Thank you. Well said.
Dr. Maleko, please be sure to have your family, all the rest of your family, watch this part of the okay. meeting as Thank well you. because they're not Thank here you. for, yes. for the nice Yes, and one more thing, yeah. one more thing, yeah. one more thing. Thank you all, really. Uh, HFC Millage, the passage, the voters sent a strong message to that, mm -hmm. uh, that day. And that also just brought so much pride uh, to my service, to our community, to this community in specific, to the Dearborn community. HFC has been a gem. And to watch um, President Cavaluna advocate for that millage, um, I felt like as excited as I was, you know, uh, and hoping, praying that the millage will pass, when I watched him advocate for it, I felt like he went to HFC. And the day he started advocating for the college, uh, his knowledge about exactly what's going on in the college, why this was needed for the success of the college, why it is needed, why we need the resources, that was also a very proud moment for me, to watch him go to different organizations and advocate, talk to different citizens and, uh, and the, about the importance of the college and being able to vote for this and him seeing the overwhelming support that he has from the entire community. Uh, what a great fresh start. So that with that, congratulations to all, to, to, to Dearborn, to, to the board, to HFC, and to you, Dr. Cavaluna. So well deserved. Well, I'd like to uh, say a few things myself. Uh, I was talking to my wife the other, just today, and I said, uh, we got two young men who are leading our P through 12, as well as our college. And neither one of them are authoritarians. Both of them are authoritative in their style. They're inclusive in their style. They respect everybody that's on their teams. They create teams. They make people feel involved in the education and everything that we need to do in a responsible way. I don't think it was really appropriate for me to say that I got thing one and thing two. <laughs> <laughs> Then again, did you see their Halloween? Uh, yeah. <laughs> we actually. Yeah. They were thing so, one and thing two. Yeah, maybe. so I, I really refer to them as boy one and boy two because I'm so old, I can get away with that. But you don't know the relief that I have personally with this kind of leadership that we needed so desperately, and we have. We're very, very fortunate to have this gentleman and the one in the back, to working together because they do like each other and they will work together for the benefit of our students. So I appreciate them. Just need to, need to say that. Okay. Any next item? Request for information and or future agenda items. Just real Anybody? Quick, just real quick. It better be. Look, uh, <laughs> I can talk very slowly from now on. <laughs> Dr. Maleko, Dr. Choco did a great job. Yes. Give us, giving us the, one of the things I was going to ask for. And I didn't want it, I, I don't want it like in a, a request for information just from now on in your, uh, in, in your part of the agenda. Just kind of give us an update on that. Yes. And the other thing is. Uh, to read by third grade? Yeah, just yeah. give us, okay. you know, obviously you got bailed out now for the next meeting, so we're good yeah. there. But uh, also the other item I'd like to see, maybe get updates, not every meeting, but every other meeting or something, is our, uh, I don't want to call it an issue, but with our bus drivers. Mm. I, I was very happy to see in the agenda and a lot of the hirees and the uh, HR section of our agenda. I was very happy to see that, but okay. uh, we need to do sure. more, obviously. Just give us, keep us in the loop. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Anybody else? Next item, please. Dr. Mead, this is your favorite part. It is. Future meeting dates. Monday, November 19, 2018. Henry Ford College Board of Trustees meeting 7 p.m. at the Henry Ford College Administrative Services and Conference Center in the Rosno Boardroom. I don't, we do not have a policy committee. They, they say they want a break. Okay, good, good, good. <laughs> you deserve a break. You've done a great job all year. Yes, yes. I just wanted to make sure. Uh, Monday, December 10th, 2018, P-12 Board of Education meeting, 7 p.m. at the Administrative Service Center in the Frank Frenchy Boardroom. And that's all I have, Mr. President. We're adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Good, Thank good you meeting. All.